Um, right, a map of 8th century England showing um, the site of the, of the Litchfield Horde in the middle of nowhere in particular. And something that we've heard about repeatedly is the marginality and liminality of this site. And that's not something which I'm going to um, dispute, though I do want to make two broad points to put a slightly different spin on it. Um, the first is to look at the location very briefly in a national context, and just to make the point that marginality depends what you mean, and there are some contexts in which the marginal can be central. Uh, the second thing, a much more length, is to look at, again at the royal and ceremonial topography of central Mercia in the 7th century, the Mercian heartland, about which I think there is now more to be said. The hoard was not deposited in that heartland, but it was deposited on the edge of it, and I hope that understanding of how that heartland works helps us to take a few more of these snail-like steps towards understanding the, the context of the hoard amid so much, more, um, so much uncertainty. Now, um, figure 6.7 in the book presents the horde as lying on the western edge of an area of Anglo-Saxon activity, and we've heard about that several times, and it's a point that was emphasised very um, forcefully by um, Howard. I would like to take a slightly different um, spin on that, or rather to, to perhaps to cut the cake in a different position, because it seems to me that the really important frontier is not this, it's actually much more like that. And it's this area of eastern England uh, where the, uh, we can see a production, uh, a consumption and exchange economy developing. We're uh, moving forward to the intensive economic activity of the 8th and 9th centuries and where there were lots of people who had lots of stuff, rather like the northern Gallic society that France was talking about. And the main point I think I want to make is lots of stuff that metal detectorists find. So it's in this area that we can see lots going on. Now, further west, and that includes areas well to the east of the Horde, actually, we find really very little. Now, that doesn't, I think, mean that not much was happening there. Indeed, I don't think it means necessarily there weren't people there who were extremely wealthy. It's just that their wealth was expressed in different ways, and in ways that are much less susceptible to being seen by us. Uh, we've already seen this map, but what I'd like to concentrate on more is Kevin's map of all 7th century gold and silver, where it does seem to me that there is a difference. The silver, of course, concentrates very heavily in the eastern zone, but actually the gold, you know, there's really quite a lot of it in the Midlands. It's true that the Savage Horde is towards the, the western edge of that, but I think here we're seeing perhaps a distinct sort of economy, maybe a more old-fashioned sort of economy, an economy of... Um, uh, uh, raiding and plundering, of, 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 of slave raiding, um, of hunting, perhaps ritualised royal hunting, of uh, central places that are unstable and spaced out, and of quick movement uh, across uh, large distances. A world in which it's perhaps the, uh, the interstitial areas between peoples that are most important in terms of people coming together and meeting on um, frontier or liminal sites. And that seems to me to be the world that the Staffordshire Horde belongs to. And if we look, um, we've seen this already, at, at my map, um, uh, where the shading um, represents what I, what I call the eastern zone, the area of intensive economic activity, there is the Horde. The uh, black square symbols are the great hall complexes. And actually, the Horde is, if viewed this way, is really in, in, in the middle of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a world in which there were uh, hall complexes, a uh, rectum to the north, the Warwickshire ones of Hatton Rock and Itchington to the south, and well to the west of the Staffordshire Horde fine spot, the Atcham Halls near Roxeter, where recent excavation this summer has uh, confirmed that they are indeed halls of the standard classic Great Hall type and has produced radiocarbon dates in the 7th century. So um, there is no question that the the Horde, although it may be locally marginal, it, it, it's marginal um, b between peoples, but it is not in the back of beyond. It's in an area where we see lavish display by Anglo-Saxon elites in the form, at least, of the Great Halls. Um, Rickneal Street is, I think, a very important part of our story, and in the 8th century, it's linking two important areas, the old Mercian heartland and the Trent, and then the um, area in the Whitwitchian territory, which is important economically and strategically, um, and where there's quite a lot of evidence for Mercian activity, because by the time of offer, there are more charters from this area. Um, Rickneal Street links the two, and indeed, just there, as we'll see, um, at the crossing of the trend, 
is Witchnor, a place name which means the over a hill form of the Witcher. Um, that, that is named in relation to a road that leads to the Witcher. And the presence of the Horde so close to this major north-south route may perhaps be significant. So here is an attempt at a new map of the Mercian heartland. Um, this is the area we've been concerned with, but I want to look mainly at a region slightly further north, going on up Hitmield Street to the Trent Dove confluence. And actually, it's in this area, at the northernmost end, that we find most evidence in the later 7th century for Mercian royal patronage in the form of the important royal ministers of Repton, Breeden, and Hanbury. The uh, remarkable earthwork at Tutbury, which I've argued on indirect evidence, might perhaps be important in the 8th century. Um, and um, the broken lines are the um, borders of the parishes. Unfortunately, there are no charter bounds, but they're the parishes named from estates granted by King Edmund to one Wolfsey the Black in 942. Now, this, of course, is much later, but given the location of these estates, it seems to me hard not at least to suspect that what we're seeing here in the 940s is the final privatisation of the old core lands of the Mercian Kingdom. And if that is true, you can see how much they um, centre around this area with Rickneal Street and the stretch of the Trent that rather oddly runs parallel with Rickneal Street forming a very strong topographical and communication spine to that area. It's where King Avalbald was murdered in 7457. Perhaps doesn't tell us very much. I suppose he can be murdered anywhere. But um, it's, um, it's, not, it's not far from the place which, of course, everybody thinks of as the major Mercian centre at Tamworth. Tamworth is not part of my story because, in my view, the balance of evidence suggests that it was not a place of importance before the 780s when it emerges as a major centre under offer, which seems to be most likely to be part of his... Um, imperial display towards the end of his reign, connected with the um, building up of Litchfield into an archiepiscopal seat, and to be much more to do with the Carolingianising of the later part of Offa's reign than with anything else that went before. So for the moment I'm going to leave Tamworth um, out of the story. How far back does all this go? The ministers first uh, appear in various ways in the late 7th to early 8th centuries. Um, at Repton, interestingly, the <coughs> Biddle's excavations found underlying the, uh, the church a hall which does look very much as though it is one of the, um, the halls of, uh, that we know so well from the Great Hall Complexes. Only a bit was found, unfortunately, but it looks as though this is one of those cases where a minster is a conversion of an existing um, hall complex. So that does push it back, well back into the 7th century, um, maybe to a point close, uh, quite close to the day of the Horde. Um, the place upon which I want to concentrate here is this, with, with the, the stipple, a stretch of flat gravel terrace between the Witchnor Crossing, the um, Tame Trent Confluence, um, going up to here near Barton under Needwood, where the road and the Trent run more or less parallel. Because I think that uh, the accumulated evidence suggests that this is a place of great importance, but it has hitherto not been properly recognised. Uh, we know its prehistoric background very well, thanks to this splendid project. There are remarkable Neolithic monuments, including this extraordinary sunburst feature, which may have remained visible in the form of shallow pits, and also the, uh, the, 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 the multi-centric timber henge uh, nearby, uh, which is important for reasons I'll come to in a moment. So there's a strong Neolithic background to this area. Here is a um, here is a, is, is, is a map of that area. There is the street. There's the trend. Um, this is the um, alluvium. So the important area is here. Um, so there are the um, Neolithic Cursus, the Sunburst Monument, the Henge, another Henge type monument there. Lots of um, Bronze Age barrows. Some interesting field names Arlo Field, there. River Barrow, maybe, certainly something Barrow. And that one, right next to the Henge, Spill Pits which appears to mean either speech pits or games pits, both of which would be appropriate to other things that we know about um, um, assembly sites in this period. And right at the heart of this is the well-known um, Anglo-Saxon settlement uh, of Catholic. 
Um, it's tempting to see this as, as, as an ordinary settlement because its material culture is very poor. But after all, that's what you get. The material culture of the Atcham Halls is almost non-existent. Um, likewise, even Yevering. Um, I think that's, that's not the criterion by which we should be measuring it. Uh, what we have at Cat Home is a multi-phase site, uh, one phase of which, though, when, when, you, when you tease it out, appears to conform to the rectilinear planning that we can now be seen widely in 7th and 8th century England, um, with the buildings conforming to um, uh, what, in, in most cases, I mean, but most much further east, is a grid of 15-foot squares, which seems to work here, though the form, the, the layout of the overall complex is not as regular as the Great Hall complexes and some of the others. Uh, if this were in Norfolk or Lincolnshire, it would not be particularly surprising. Here in Staffordshire, it is unique, and I think one needs to um, recognise the singularity of this, of this place um, for what it is where it is. Um, in some ways, it's like um, a, a, an Eastern English settlement transported into the Trent Valley. Um, the other thing that the, the plans of this site often don't show, but I think is perhaps the most important feature, is this prehistoric barrow here. Now, this appears to be probably at least partly upstanding on the edge of the trend, and I think probably what we have here is a sort of complex that's actually um, formed facing that barrow, which would be the backdrop against the river. It's a quite large building, though, though, though not on the scale of the Great Halls. Um, John Hines' recent uh, reanalysis of radiocarbon dates um, produces two um, dates which are relevant to the formal phase, both of which are calibrated for in the range of about 600 to 660. So here we've got a site that's pretty close to the date of the hall. And in my um, recent book, I suggested that this was part of a wider ceremonial landscape, but now there's more to say. And I'm grateful to um, uh, Susie Blake for drawing my attention to a recent important excavation by Phoenix Consulting, which makes two important contributions, one at the northern end of the complex and the other at the south. This is the um, area at the southern end where there are prehistoric um, ditches and enclosures, but also that which is interpreted as a pair of enclosures, but in fact it's clearly a pair of large buildings. Um, there they are, and, and in particular that one, I think is clearly recognisable as the um, one end of one of the um, double annexed halls that are so characteristic of the hall complexes. It's rather a small one, but that I think is what it is. And if you look, for example, at the Itchington site, um, the, this, this hall there, um, that is what we have got there. Um, at the north end of the complex, there is this. Another of these many Bronze Age barrows, this time enclosed within a rectilinear enclosure. Now, this, in fact, is 11th century. It's much later. It's got pottery dating. But I think that's still very relevant, because what it suggests is that the habit of assembly on this site, if that's what this indicates, it's a bit hard to see. I mean, clearly what we've got here is a prehistoric monument that's being developed or, or accentuated in some way. Uh, this is still happening at the end of the Anglo-Saxon period, and maybe um, is, is a hint at a, at a long continuing um, life of this um, complex. So, um, what, what have we got? We've got the road and the river, we've got the, um, uh, the alluvium, the, the, the meadowland, um, we've got the gravel terrace, the Neolithic and Bronze Age monuments, we've also there got a small Iron Age hill fort, um, we've got the Anglo-Saxon features. And these are all features that can be very widely paralleled in a range of known high-status residential and assembly sites. And just to rattle through some of them, um, on the Upper Thames, um, Ensham, um, in, later in Minster, and one of these places in this um, Anglo-Saxon Chronicle en entry, um, an area of gravel terrace uh, facing a broad expanse of alluvial meadowland along the Thames. Likewise, the Great and Southern Courtney um, side, exactly the same sort of topography. Um, and the same point is being made by Chris Scull in relation to Rendlesham. Once again, um, this, this strip of riverine land with rich meadowland. Um, Ros Faith and De Debbie Bannon, in their recent book on Anglo Saxon farms and farming, emphasised the pastoral aspect and how much you would expect. Um, high status activity to take place near uh, land that, that, can, that, that can produce um, uh, uh, um, um, hay. Um, <clears throat> assembly around the Roman road and prehistoric monuments. This is the example from the Dorset Downs, the 
um, colophon in the Durham manuscript, which says that Provost Aldred was in the bishop's tent in the assembly in 970, just there. Um, other documented assemblies in charter attestations, the Roman road, and the wall barrow uh, with its um, um, Ang Anglo-Saxon execution burials. Um, I think the, the point is that um, we shouldn't think in terms of assembly sites. We should think in terms of assembly zones, areas within which recurrent activities take place. People keep on coming back, building on them, using them, and developing them in different ways. And likewise, here, there's something Courtney site we've seen already. There is the hall complex. Uh, the name presumably indicates that it's a southern tomb of Abingdon, uh, a minster where there is a, a royal charter attestation, um, and um, this is uh, supposed to be where King Alfred was, was, was married, um, the, the rich um, uh, a 7th century cemetery of Milton just there. Again, a zone <coughs> of, of, on, on the low-lying land of the Thames. And um, the same site here, just showing the importance of this prehistoric background. You get this time and time again. We've already seen examples of this with the halls there. Um, earlier, something featured buildings um, against the, the backdrop of um, prehistoric monuments. This um, Helena Hammerer's um, uh, uh, work of, of many years on this site. And the way in which some of the hall complexes um, present themselves with um, multiple phases of hall groups, often two or three phases, which in a case like this one at Sproston is are spread um, awkwardly over the site, a bit like a camping site, and we come back to the point about tents. People keep on coming back, they build halls which are grand but quite short lifespan structures, um, and they go and people come back and use the site again, and that surely is what we're seeing um, in the case of um, the, the, the cat home area. And then the hill fort, um, less common, but there are some cases where hill forts are used either as the sites or as the backdrops to important assemblies, as, as in the, the case of Greatly, as discussed by Ryan Lavelle. So to be quite honest, if we're looking for criteria for identifying um, an important um, uh, 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 an area of recurrent assembly um, and, 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 and royal activity, it's hard to think of a box that this complex doesn't tick. Um, it really does um, get, get them all, and I think that um, we are um, looking at what must have been a very, very significant uh, place of assembly. Maybe even, it's not too, much, not too rash to suggest, possibly the main central area in the Mercian heartland. Um, and note that the, the Staffordshire Hall is not actually in it. Um, well, of course, it's undocumented, and it would be undocumented, because we've got hardly any Mercian documents. Or is it? Um, one of the earliest Mercian charters is this um, grant to Breeden by Alfred of Mercia, issued in his Cupiculum, interesting word, in the Vicus, which is called Tomtun. Now, all we can infer from the, the place named Tomtun is that it's a tune on the River Tame. Um, it's sometimes been suggested this is Tamworth, but I think there's no reason whatsoever to suppose it is Tamworth. A, a, a tune is a tune and a worth is a worth. And all we can say is that both of these places were on the Tame. So this is a, a royal vicus somewhere on the River Tame. And in terms of certainty, that's as far as we can get. But we can perhaps speculate a bit more. Uh, this is a very early tune name. So I think it's about the second or third tune place name to be recorded. Actually, tune names... Uh, relating to river names, you might think are very common. They aren't that common. They're, there's a handful of them, but there aren't that many. Now, sometimes the, the tune is just any old place along the river, it seems, but a few of them have a rather more distinctive um, uh, geography where the tune named after the river is at its confluence with a larger river. So here is Frampton on Severn. Um, the place name means the tune on the throne, but actually it's, on, it's really more close on the Severn. Likewise, Framilo there, where, 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 where the throne um, leads, leads into the seven. So that's one example of a, of a river tune name, which is at, at the confluence. Um, uh, Thomas Satter, of course, are a, a people name, as are Will Satter. It just occurred to me to have a look at Wilton, given it, that it's a tune uh, with a similar um, a, 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 a sort of formation history, uh, even though uh, recorded later. I mean, there is Wilton at the um, confluence of the River Wiley with the Nadder. Now, let us just suppose, for the sake of argument, that Tom Toon occupied a similar location on the Tame, and that's where it would be, just facing Catholic. 
So um, although one can't prove that, I think that one can make a, a, a suggestion of at least a plausible conjecture that this assembly of Hiathored, where he has cubiculum, was somewhere very close to the complex that I have just been describing. So how does that place the horde in relation to the Mercian heartland? Um, it wasn't put somewhere up here. Um, it was put here, which was outside this intensively um, uh, um, marked zone, um, but of course it was closer to the main west-east road, and as several people have said today, its significance near this major crossroads um, is probably very important. Um, different sorts of assemblies no doubt happened um, at different times in different places and as others have said there are other place names in this area which might point to assembly activities. The place to which really the horde relates if it relates to anything uh, unless it's named castle is of course Letter Catum and that's where the um, here again Della Hook's map which we've um, already seen um, actually the, the other one shows it better doesn't it um, there is the mystery of the relationship between Lettercatum and Lichfield. Lichfield first appears in the life of Wilfrid, where, which says that um, uh, King Wulfhera gave to Wilfrid, or had given to him, uh, the Episcopal seat of Lichfield, which was very well prepared, paratus already, to be the seat either for him or any other bishop he chooses. Bishop just needs to just put a walk in and sit down at his desk, it seems. And what exactly does that mean? Um, well, in fact, that was just as well because Wilfred didn't want it. He gave it to somebody else as a consolation prize for not getting another C that Wilfred did want. But um, the, uh, the, what we, we can infer from that is that Litchfield was there and in some way prepared to be an Episcopal seat um, in the 660s. We then go to the Welsh source, which survives in a late manuscript, as Barbara York commented in the book, well, it is a late manuscript, um, which refers to the um, raid of, um, which didn't spare the bishop and book-holding monks at Caer Lutgoid, and um, uh, um, th th at least I think one could probably fairly um, infer that there is an old established tradition of that place um, being an ecclesiastical centre. And the use of the word Caer almost certainly has to be referring to uh, Letter Cajun, not to Lichfield, um, because Lichfield is neither a Roman walled place nor um, uh, an Iron Age hill fort, though there has recently been an excavation of, 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 of a, a sub-Roman, uh, very interesting sub-Roman building in Lichfield, but that's about it. So there is a tradition of a time when perhaps war was an ecclesiastical centre, and I wonder whether we should maybe be thinking of some reorientation, perhaps happening around the time of the deposition of the Horde, maybe connected with the relocation of the seat of Lichfield, maybe connected in the next generation with greater emphasis on the area up here. So maybe the Horde is deposited at a time when actually this area is changing. If one could draw a map of this sort, for let's say circa 620 rather than circa 680, maybe we see something different. Once again, as in all of this, we are groping in the dark um, through various possible conjectures, but I hope that what I've said at least puts a little bit more uh, possible context to the uh, world in which the hoard was deposited. <laughs>